I get it. It's scary hearing about what quantum computers could do to Bitcoin one day, if or when they actually arrive. But here's the thing. Understanding how Bitcoin's encryption actually works is the key to understanding how quantum can, or more importantly, can't disrupt it. And what I'm about to show you will completely flip the script on your perspective, because while everybody else is panic selling based on fear, on headlines, you'll have the technical knowledge to stay calm and potentially profit from their fear. Now, I've been building tech companies for decades. I'm a partner at a leading Bitcoin venture fund. I'm an officer of a publicly traded Bitcoin company, and this is the same analysis that we use internally, and now you can profit from it too. So let's go. All right, we're gonna jump right in. We're gonna talk about quantum computing and Bitcoin. Now, first of all, this is a technical discussion, but I'm gonna make it as simple and easy to understand. So no matter where you're at with your age, your technical ability, we're gonna make it clear for you. I'm also gonna tell you just right up front, spoiler alert, there is some Bitcoin that is at risk and some that's not as at risk. And if the stuff is at risk, there's things that we can do about it, okay? I'm gonna give you all that. But the first thing we have to understand is that quantum computing is not here. So in the world, everything is possible, but not everything is probable. So we don't wanna worry about everything that's possible to happen in the world. Aliens could come destroy the world tomorrow. It's, it's possible, it's not very probable. So quantum computing, Google put out a, a alert, an update. They said quantum computing could, it could break Bitcoin-like encryption, it could, because it's hypothetical, we don't have it. Now potentially, we don't know, it could be eight to 10 years away. So we don't even really have to worry about this right now. However, we're gonna address this front on. So Google update, it's coming eventually. They said that it could come faster than we think, it could use 20 times less resources. And uh, finding, didn't, the finding didn't mention Bitcoin, they said Bitcoin-like encryption. Okay, so let's just dispel some of that FUD right off the bat. But let's get right into this and see what part of Bitcoin is at risk and what's it not. So you have to understand, first of all, that Bitcoin is encrypted, obviously, right? That's the crypto part of the cryptocurrency, the cryptography, okay? Now, within that, you have what's called a public key and a private key. Let me explain this for you real simply. So if I had a locker at my school, and I would, that locker is, let's say, C19. So that's my public address. And I could say, hey, go put this, this uh, letter in my public address, in my C19. You could walk over there, slide it in. But only I would have a private key to actually open it up and move the contents. So that's how Bitcoin and cryptocurrency works in general. There's a public key that everybody could see, but then only you would have a private key that you could open up. That's the basics of it. Now, there's different types of cryptography that we've had to secure those keys, and it changes over time. I'm gonna take you through some of these changes because understanding that is the key to understand if you're at risk. So a couple of that we've had, the first version of the key was a, the public key was used instead of a hash. So what this means is that everybody could see the public key. All the types of signature schemes that we've had since then do it differently. Instead of showing the world the public key, they use a hash in the blockchain. So they, they put a signal inside the main blockchain to the public key, but the public key is not available. That's a really key piece to understanding what's going on. Why is that? Because of the quantum risk. Okay, now what is at risk of quantum? Well, the P2PK, that was the first scheme, it is immediately vulnerable to quantum. Watch out, quantum could attack this. How? How does it attack it? That's because, as I explained before, the public key was shown. It wasn't a hash of a public key like it is with later versions. The entire key was shown. Now, in this instance, the hash hides the key, so it's not readily available. That's why later versions of the schemes are quantum resistant. So how big of a problem is this? Well, Bitcoin that was mined before March of 2010, so from 2009 to 2010, just in that window are the only ones that uses that scheme. So basically everything after that point is impossible to break the hash. Okay, so the Bitcoin blockchain is, is secure. It can't break the hash. It could only break and get the public key if it's readily available. And that's only for keys that were made before March of 2010. And assuming that the Bitcoin has never been moved. Why is that? Well, we have to understand what's at stake. So in that period from 2009 to 2010, 1.7 million Bitcoin were mined during that period. It was the golden age. Anybody could plug in a computer and get Bitcoin. It was amazing. 
I wasn't doing it, unfortunately. 1.7 million Bitcoin were mined up until that date of March 2010. And again, they used the pay to public key where it was readily available. Now of that 1.7 million, that's what's at risk right now. 95% of that Bitcoin has never moved. Most likely people lost their keys. Now Satoshi, whoever Satoshi is, was, whatever, has a certain amount of keys in their wallet. We can see that there's about 1.1 million Bitcoin sitting in that wallet. It's about 5% of the supply. At today's current price, which we're making new all time highs at the time we're recording this, it's about $124 billion. That would put Satoshi, if they can claim this wallet, or whoever could claim this wallet, in uh, the 12th richest person in the world right now today. Okay, so, so what's at risk here? Well, what's at risk is these coins right here. So hypothetically, they could break in, they could steal those coins, and then what? They would own them, they'd be the 12th richest person. Uh, they could dump them in the market. They could potentially short term, you know, crash the price until the market absorbed those and went back up. But that's really the total potential risk that we have. That's what's at stake. However, there's solutions for this, right? Problems, solutions. So a couple things that can be done. Number one, if you have coins, if you're lucky enough to have gotten coins in that period before March of 2010, all you need to do is just move your coins to a new wallet address you're automatically secure. If Satoshi could sub, uh, come, come to light, he could move his coins as well. However, the ecosystem doesn't want uh, a hacker using some quantum computing to get those coins. So even those have potential security. So a solution would be an hourglass. And basically an hourglass would be to put those wallets into this frame that would limit the movement of those. All right, so what we could do is you could put some sort of constraints around it. So for example, no more than one Bitcoin could be moved per block. So that way they just couldn't take the 1.1 million. It would drip very slowly over a long period of time. And so they would set the rate at which they'd move and the time, the date of when they'd move. So for example, you'd say uh, approximately 120 years, you could move all those coins. So drip very slowly would barely mean anything to the ecosystem. And that would be no matter how hard or how strong quantum computing gets, they would be limited by the rates of that network of that hourglass that Git puts in. Okay. Okay. What about the other signatures? So as I said, there's been lots of different variations of these signatures that have happened. We've had SegWit, we've had Taproot, we've had P2P, PKH, all these different things, lots of different schemes. Well, again, all of those obscure, all of them hide the public key by putting a hash into the blockchain. So what does that really mean? Well, what that means is that the public key is going to be hidden until, until you spend from that wallet. So what happens is it's safe. They can't get into it because they can't see the public key, it's hidden. But if you spend from that wallet, then all of a sudden the public key is displayed. So now quantum could get it. So what does that mean? Well, what that means is that if you spend from that wallet and leave money in there, leave Bitcoin in there, that Bitcoin could be susceptible if you leave a balance in there. So what do you do? Well, solution, you create a new wallet. So if you're gonna spend from that wallet, which would expose the public key, you're going to spend whatever you need, transfer the Bitcoin to whoever, and then whatever the balance is left, you move that into a new wallet and then it'd be safe. All right, that's the solution. Now, Satoshi actually recommended this. The recommendation for a good security is to always use a new wallet. You can create as many of them as you want. You can go into, usually most hardware wallets will support this, and you can just create as many wallet addresses if you want. Now, one thing that I didn't say at the beginning is this is all about you managing your own private key. One of the most revolutionary things about Bitcoin is for the first time in humanity, we can own property that cannot be seized. It might be the oldest problem that humanity's ever had. How do I protect my chickens or my goats from being stolen? So we have, a, we, we, we have friends, we have a, a village, we have a kingdom, we have a country to protect our assets. And now we can protect our assets with just a cryptographic key. It might be the most revolutionary thing ever. And so I think we should take advantage of that. I advocate for securing your own Bitcoin with your key. However, if you have your Bitcoin on an exchange, like at Coinbase, they have your key. If you have it on a river, they have your key. If you have it through an ETF, they hold the key. So you don't need to worry about any of this. It's for those that are taking their own custody. But again, Satoshi recommended that always use new address wallets. That's the key default if you're going to do this. Now, what about Lightning? Because Lightning is like layer two, and it's how we can move Bitcoin way faster, cheaper, more privately than we can on the main chain. So what about that? Could that be broken? Well, not really, because the public key it gets, it gets revealed when the channel closes. So the channel opens up, we put some money in there, it gets exchanged and the channel closes. Now by default, 
they're actually pretty okay. Now, of course, there's some mitigation that, be, that can be done, but of course, we don't have quantum, so we're not exactly sure how to prepare for it because we don't even have it yet. All right, so you have to understand a lot of this is hypothetical. We don't know what we're preparing for yet, but we know that we're pretty safe. Okay, one more thing. There's the mempool. So what happens is there's all these transactions happening. I'm transferring to you, you're transferring to them, and these traction, transactions go into what's called the mempool. And then the miners, the Bitcoin miners, will process those transactions. Okay, now the transactions, they get broadcast. We have to show them to all the miners so they can get the transaction and process. Okay, transfer this money to that person, transfer to this person, right? So that's the problem. The public key is, it's public in there, so it's vulnerable. Now, it's not just that easy. It would require a massive amount of uh, computer power. It would be, have to be brute force attack. So it's not trivial by any means, but it's possible that could be a potential attack vector. However, again, there are solutions to this. So for example, we could do delays where things couldn't move right away. We could use quantum proof addresses. So again, we can change those address schemes and we can move them into quantum proof addresses. So none of this is catastrophic. There is some danger if you don't do anything or you don't do things right, but none of this is catastrophic. It can all be fixed. Now, what about post quantum? So in 2009, we had a, a scheme. 2009, we had another one. 2012, 2015, 2017, 2021. What is next? Again, we can come up with a new key scheme. I don't know, 2030, 2028. We don't know, but we can come up with a new scheme that everyone could move their wallets into this one to be post quantum resistant. So it's not the big risk like everybody thinks it is. Now, some will be at risk, some might. Now, so moving forward, what do we want to do? Number one, don't panic. And certainly don't go buy like these quantum resistant tokens that these scam artists are trying to sell you. Okay. Bitcoin is going to be perfectly fine as long as you use a little bit of reasonable common sense. Number two, use wallets, uh, new wallets. Don't reuse old ones. All right. So again, you can create as many wallets as you want, spend what you want to spend and move the rest to a new wallet. Simple. Also move UTXO. So UTXO are unspent transactions. Move those into new addresses. The new addresses are going to be safe. Also think of it like a checking versus savings. All right. So my savings is something that sits in like cold storage. It's deep in dark, cold storage. The checking is like something I'm spending from. Maybe think about like your wallet. You wouldn't walk around town with all the money in the world in the wallet. You just kind of take what you need for the day. And if, if you lost it, it's not the end of the world. So think about your Bitcoin in custody, sort of like that. So your stuff is in deep, cold storage. I don't have to worry about that. I put a little bit if I want to go spend some of it, keep it in a new wallet to keep it safe and ignore the FUD. Bitcoin's not going to be crashed by quantum. It's perfectly safe. So now that you know that your Bitcoin is perfectly safe, the next thing you probably want to know is like, what could the price be in 2030, 2040, and 2050? If you want to know that and want to see the math to break down what those price points and predictions are, you probably want to go watch this video right here. Otherwise, I'll see you over there. And that's what I got to your success.